Hey, thanks for coming to my talk, Going Beyond Bronze Blanquettes to Reveal Forest Structure Species Relationships. This talk is going to be largely based on the paper seen here. I'd like to acknowledge my co-lead author, Samantha Dietz, as well as my other co-authors and the organizations that made this possible. I'd also like to mention there's a QR link below that'll take you to the full text and supplementary materials. So one topic at the forefront of current ecological research is the importance to protect, promote, and manage biodiversity. But how can we do that if we can't measure it well enough or frequently enough to inform progress towards those goals? But we all know that quantifying plant richness is hard. It's a critical metric of biodiversity and critical metric to understanding the effects of fire and fire ecology is often limited though by the botanical expertise of observers. Or if we choose to include it in our surveys, then we have to budget for that additional time and those resources. And traditional method, methods to quantify structure are focused on simplifying three-dimensional structures, these really complex three-dimensional structures that are out in the forest into simple estimations of cover and height. And vegetation is generally classified by broad functional groups thanks to uh, work from Braun Blanquet and, those, and others. Like Daubenmeyer, we classify things in ocular estimates, which makes them very easy to repeat across different observers over time. But then we're also stuck with these broad ranges in which to estimate covers, such as 5 to 25% cover. So as a result, these inferences are likely subject to bias between some observer and based on their different opinions. And they lack the fine scale detail to, uh, to detect change in some cases. And um, you know, this is a central problem around common monitoring where you, are, you have limited time and resources, but you need to be measuring the effects of your action. So how can we improve the way we understand the effects of fire and define progress towards these goals? Well, we could do more elaborate statistics, but we all know that We've made a lot of efforts there, but certainly taking more samples is always better. And, um, but we know that we're limited there also, right? The allotted time and resources to get out in the field and take those samples or the days that those samples are available are always limited. So maybe we could take better measurements. You know, we could take the measurements we normally take, we could do a better job of taking them. So we could develop new systems to do that. Or maybe we could take new measurements. Maybe there's measurements that are out there that we haven't conceived of yet that could help guide management or help us under, by, understand biodiversity in a way that we haven't in the past. So we looked into this for this project and we thought terrestrial laser scanning, TLS, also called ground-based LIDAR, might be a way to do that. And TLS, as I'm sure you've heard of, and we'll hear of many times this week in other presentations, it creates a fine scale point cloud. It's really different than airborne LIDAR because of the density of the point cloud, much finer uh, scale dimension 3D models of the landscape, many more thousands of points per square meter. And so it allows for really fine scale millimeter measurement of the microstructure of the understory. And that's one of the other advantages because it is conducted from the ground. It does have a different perspective than airborne LIDAR and also some additional potential measurements that can be taken. And then really the key for us into folding this into our routine monitoring for long leaf restoration projects was that it's become portable. Uh, our device is two pounds and it can be mounted on a tripod and so it can easily be folded into our existing operations, especially because a given scan of a plot may only take two to four minutes. So really easy. And that was key to us to being able to apply this to our projects or any other way. So can terrestrial LIDAR add us, allow us to add additional measurements or take better measurements? And that's what we wanted to, to test here and see if it could be something that we could really use uh, in everyday monitoring now. And so our study area was here in the Panhandle of Florida, USA. And our sites were Tyndall Air Force Base and Flint Rock, where they're both restoring longleaf systems. So we used paired plots with our traditional methods that were already set up with radial 
Ocular estimates and subplots and macro plots spread across the landscape across a gradient of habitats and conditions. And these sites range typical uh, forest of the southeast coastal plain from those that are uh, very wet and seasonally flooded to those that are high and dry, also low and high diversity sites, frequent fire and infrequent site. We really want to sample the entire range of uh, potential conditions at these sites. And so in each one of those subplots, we also conducted a terrestrial LIDAR scan. And then for the model, we wanted to compare and see, could we build a model based on the traditional me metrics, the metrics we'd already been taking, those field metrics, the new metrics from the LIDAR or some combination. And we wanted to see using those different models, could we predict herb richness, shrub richness, and total richness as a test? And so, um, some of the LIDAR metrics we used were X, Y, and Z. We used the mean, max, and uh, min, as well as the standard deviation, um, and also intensity. And uh, the standard deviation is interesting because the way it's calculated uses, um, you know, the variance around the different returns as seen here. So this is an example of calculating the standard deviation of Z. You would see in this case, there's a high degree of difference between the points which will result in a high standard deviation. And then here, an example of X and how the different points would help, you could calculate standard deviation from the uh, different returns in this conceptual figure. So uh, we also, besides the XYZ coordinates and their um, calculations with those, we did calculations with the strata. So we broke up canopy cover or point density into different strata we thought were being important. And then we also tried different radial samples around the plot center to produce all those different values. And so we identified every species in each subplot. Um, and then we collected uh, ocular estimates in each one of the subplots some common metrics like shrub cover and herb cover, and some very specific to the local area and species that they're interested in, like wiregrass cover. So the results, here's our overall richness model. You can see that the combination of terrestrial LIDAR metrics and traditional metrics in these combination and full models were the best to predict richness. We tested those across a number of uh, criterion and base factor and root mean square and error and to develop an overall performance score that we used to rank our models. And you can see that the X and Y relationship here with the uh, Y is the total species richness and X is the fitted predictions of richness um, yielded a pretty good fit for total species, certainly significant, probably usable for most monitoring programs. In the model, the most important variables of that top model were, um, as seen here in the red box, the natural community type, followed by some uh, LIDAR variable Z mean, so the height, the mean of the height of all the points, the maximum of the points, so really tall forests in this case had a positive effect on richness, and the standard deviation of X, so moving away from the center of the plot, the standard deviation of that had a positive effect. So the more variability in that metric of horizontal uh, distance from the center point of the plot had a positive effect. Um, also, we see that some traditional metrics, herb cover and palmetto, a shrub type here in Florida, and the percentage of points less than one is also important. So a strata metric. So here we have natural community classification type, standard ocular estimates, and then also LIDAR and strata metrics being important in the overall model. The shrub model. Um, also, again, here we had um, a combination model using both terrestrial LIDAR and traditional metrics being the top model. And the fit was not as good here. Um, I doubt that many programs are just trying to predict shrub species richness. Um, there was a significant um, correlation here and probably uh, not quite as good as either the richness or the herb model, 
are probably usable for a general index of high, medium, low strobridges, but also uh, most of the richness in these plots would have been in the understory. So it's an overall relatively insignificant part of the total number of species. So here again in the shrub model, the natural community type was important as well as the Z mean or the height mean and the X max. So how far points could go out from the center of the plot um, was important to the shrub diversity with a positive effect and a negative effect from the Z mean height. So um, the lower the Z mean, the better effect on the shrub richness. And then also we have some LIDAR metrics here, which make a lot of sense in the strata column. So it's strata between one and three meters and the strata between nine to 12 meters uh, that we know are, are very important and probably overall shrub diversity where, where both had a positive effect on the model. Um, really a significant effect here when one to three, that, that area with the most um, shrub species. In the herb model, again, we had a combination of LIDAR and traditional metrics rounding out all the best performing models. And the best, uh, best fit here um, of all the models for herb species richness, which accounted for most of the species in the plot, uh, a good fit here, a high R squared and a very significant uh, fit there certainly, certainly could be used as an index for most monitoring programs. Again, we have the natural community type being really important, as well as the uh, some LIDAR metrics, Z-mean and Z-max, so really positive effect on overall richness from taller forests, uh, and a negative effect uh, in our herb richness if, um, if you had a really low canopy. So um, if the mean of Z was, was really low, um, that would be a negative effect on the total herb richness. So they like the tall canopies uh, in this case. And you can see some of the traditional metrics here, herb cover, canopy cover, and palm cover. Um, herb cover being really positively related to um, uh, herb species and uh, canopy cover being negatively related uh, to total herb species. So a tall, thin canopy in this case was the best with palm cover. Uh, really reducing uh, richness also. And then a lot of these uh, canopy metrics are really important here in the herb species model. So you can see that percentage of points between six and nine meters um, and 12 to 15 meters and 15 to 18 and greater than 21 um, were really all important in this final herb richness model. So the canopy dynamics uh, were really important there. So in summary, vegetation models uh, or richness models rather with a combination of LIDAR derived variables and traditional metrics outperform models using only one method in every case. It was really the combination of the two that were most powerful in making the predictions. And the terrestrial LIDAR uses complexity in novel ways uh, with simple parameters. There's lots of great work being done out there with a lot of really great algorithms to apply for your TLS data. Here we just use some of the most simple metrics that you can, uh, you can even uh, conduct just on a simple spreadsheet to populate our model. Um, and they were very successful. So to me, even shows more power in uh, this is a technology that can be used right alongside your normal monitoring, but produce metrics that wouldn't be possible otherwise in a pretty easy and efficient manner. And interestingly, terrestrial LIDAR verifies forest structure, plant species relationships. So what we've seen in this data is some stuff we already knew about uh, canopy dynamics and the effect of canopy on understory richness and the openness of Southern pine forests, like a really exemplary pine forest is the one seen in the background here. You know, that is a real high diversity plot. And you can see it's also very open and we're able to not only measure those, um, but by new metrics and easy metrics that would be highly repeatable to measure those things that could be used in monitoring um, and used to set restoration goals. Now I will mention there, you'll probably see this week and in many other talks, there's a lot of really cool other uh, metrics that you could 
that we could have used in populating these models. Tree metrics, uh, there's RGB in the unit we um, use that could be used. Also, there's gap canopy metrics and fuels metrics and many others. Uh, there's a flood of these things coming online right now. So um, I just wanna mention that, that those are all out there and, and, and uh, definitely could be used to even make a better model for your site. Um, again, I just want to thank, it's really the people that made this possible. Again, Samantha, thanks, uh, Samantha there in the background picture and Amy for the fantastic uh, taxonomic work she did in the mosquito net there. And then also thank Melanie and Brian for the field work and definitely thanks to the folks at Tall Timbers for their assistance with terrestrial LIDAR planning and providing the units for this. Again, the QR link is below and my contact information if you have any questions. Thank you.